for very layman people even if you are not a software developer you will or uh, or a core devops you will still be able to grab something out of it and for those who are already seasoned devops i think uh, you you stick to it till the end because the demo will describe a lot of things for you and i i will try my best to give you something new so let's get into the containers so why we need containerization or what it is so basically containerization is um first of all we need to compare what's there in the legacy market uh what people were using before containerization so if you know that aws the amazon web services are there because of the virtualization so initially they started up with the concept called virtual machines in their operating systems and they installed it in their cloud or data centers in all their uh, servers so all those servers were having many virtual machines and you hire those virtual machines and put up your load on so containerization is basically replacing those virtual machines into further micro uh, operating systems or you could say processing machines so what's the difference uh, in the core architecture is that the virtual machines comes up on a hypervisor or i would say on a hardware where they need an operating system on the host and then there is an hypervisor in the hardware that supports those virtual machines and then you prepare a complete virtual machine with the, with a separate operating system with your uh, bins different other files and all that and on top of it you deploy your app so let's say in this example in in this picture i'm showing an app 2 and app 3 which is residing on a virtual machine which is installed on a sorry on a guest operating system when it comes to dockers uh, so when it comes to containerization we know the the biggest containerization infrastructure is dockers there are many others as well but dockers is the most famous one so i will stick to dockers so what docker does is it it uses the same operating system same infrastructure and it installs a docker engine on top of it however when it comes to the deployment of the uh, docker containers it does not require a guest os it has a very small fingerprint and you can deploy hundreds of dockers on a very small machine as well so whereas when you deploy uh, an app on a virtual machine you require huge resources you require huge memory huge cpu and you might end up deploying only 2 3 or 4 virtual machines on a very nice uh, hardware machine however in case of dockers you can deploy maybe 50 or 100 apps on a single bare bone uh, bare metal machine so let's get into the the dockers application code so basically i will deep dive into dockers uh, architecture by showing you an application which is written in node so this is a code that i have written a very small node application so it it is doing nothing it's just taking all the request from uh, on on port 80 and just responding with a hello world message and on the console we will be looking at a server listening on port 8080 so i'll be showing you this particular uh, example by running it in my console then we need a docker file to convert this particular application into a container so that's the only part that's the core part of docker that's a complete anatomy of an application converted from a legacy application into a uh, container so if you have these two files an application code may be written in a js file and the docker file that's it then you only need a docker engine to convert this this particular application into a complete docker file a uh, con- complete con- uh, container so let's start uh let me show you this by just giving you an example over here okay 
So here I am. If you see, I'm, I have just only two files, a Docker file and a server.js. So all I need is convert these two files into a container. And what I can do is I can use a Docker build and then I can tell it that, okay, this directory, use it, use this directory to build a Docker. And then I can name that Docker to be assembly example. So when I press enter, it will start building my container. Now it has created a container with this name. So let's see if we have it. Docker images. Now we have this uh, term called images. So images in Docker's are the kind of manifest to create multiple containers. So I have a lot of uh, images in my system which I can utilize to deploy containers. So if you see, I have written wrong spelling here, but that's okay. Okay, I'm just changing it. And if you see that I have this Docker built already 11 seconds ago. Now what I can do is I can utilize this Docker by running a container from this particular image. Okay, so Docker run, and then I can tell it that I want to run it on port, let's say, uh, 8080, and forward it to port 3000. So port, uh, port 80 is, port 80 is basically the port that we were, uh, looking at here so if you see we are listening on port 80 and uh, for that reason we'll be forwarding all the requests from our local pc to port 80 and then we will name the docker image which is assembly assembly example So server is listening on port 8080. So let's do it. Let's test it, whether it's running or not. Local host. It's a demo time. You never know. Okay, hello world. So that's it. Uh, that's all we need to do to containerize. And now, if I want to run another application, all I need to do is I can run another one and I can say that for use port uh, 80, 81, forward it to 80, and the same assembly dash exam. It will run 80, 81 is taken. Okay, 80, 82. Okay, so okay, I will increase. So we have this another container running on port eighty eighty two, one container running on port eighty eighty. So all of these applications are running already, and I can run as many as I want. So basically, what is running and what is this Docker all about? So I will just deep dive into this Docker file to let you understand that what exactly is this Docker file and how it is encapsulating the uh, the application code into a container. So the first, there are only four commands that I have written in the Docker file. The first instruction says that prepare a container from Node Alpine, and I have just given a version of that particular server. So basically, Docker file will look into Docker Hub, which is a repository, online repository for Docker registries. So there are many companies, there are many companies like Node, like Microsoft and all, all of the Red Hat and all other uh, big names. They have kept their own images of, uh, of, of their assets or of their software assets into software uh, Docker containers. 
they containerize it already and they are free to use. So what I'm telling this Docker file is that look on that Docker Hub for a Node container or Node image with the version 12.16.1 running on a Linux Alpine. So by doing this, it will download that image into my local uh, local Docker engine. And that particular container will be containing an Alpine version of Linux. On top of, on top of that Linux operating system, there will be a Node version 12.16.1 installed. So I have that image ready in this Docker file when I write from. Then I copy my local directory into the local directory of that container. Then I tell that once that is copied, and if somebody tries to do Docker run, then run this command. This command is basically the node server. So if you see here, when I was showing you my local directory, it was basically, and it doesn't terminate. So you have to be very careful with that. When you run, either you can run in daemon or Okay, CD desktop. This is our code, and I have to. Okay, now the font is okay, Nikhil. Okay, so if I do this, my file name or application file name is server.js. So I will just move this here. Move this here. To it. Okay. So what I'm telling Docker is that run this server.js in node. So that's the third command. And then I'm telling that server that expose your port 80. Why am I I'm exposing 80? Because I'm listening on port 80. If I'm listening on another port, I will be exposing the other port. So that's it. By doing this, we have created a and created an image, but that image is created in our local docker engine repository which is here so if you see that image is created here and if i want to push it i can use a docker push command and it will push on my repository or my account on uh, docker hub repository so this is where normally the the term that is used for uh, docker hub is registry so docker registries are there on on cloud with the name of docker hub or even Google has its own Google repositories for uh, for Docker's. You can host it there, and GitLab also provides uh, these uh, these repositories for you. But here, all of these uh, images are there in my Docker repository, which is in my local uh, local machine. Okay, so this is all from the dockerization or containerization. So I have ran these commands basically in, in the terminal. And I will be showing you another command, which is docker ps, which shows the running containers. So if you see, I have two containers running from my previous commands, which are five minutes and six minutes ago. And then I have 18 hours ago, one uh, a small container, which I was testing. So anyways, this is how you can see what all is running. So as I was mentioning that by dockerizing or by containerizing the applications, you can run many different applications on a very smaller machine compared to virtual machines. And it's very easy as well to port the codes or to port the images from the Docker Hub or from other repositories. And it's just a small command and it, it runs so quickly. Okay. So let's get into the complexities that it brings. So once you start containerization and you develop your application using microservices, you get into a huge complexity because everything is broken down into pieces. For example, an application would definitely require uh, user authentications, payment gateways, accounting, um, product listing, carts, uh, cart handling, um, notifications, and push notifications, and I don't know what and what. 
So when you break down the application into microservices using these separate concerns, what you do is you bring in a lot of complexities. A lot of these applications are have, have to start communicating with each other. And that communication brings in huge complexities because there is a possibility that some microservice or a, uh, one of your microservice is down or is not healthy or it's not ready yet. And you are sending requests to it and thinking that the request will be fulfilled and you will get the response. But you will not get the response because it's not up or because of any reason. And what happens is that you get um, unexpected responses and you will scratch your head to find out what is down because you would have to find out in a in a big microservices cluster like these so if you see netflix has more than 700 microservices but when they start running it they run more than 200000 instances of it so these 200000 instances of each microservice if any one of them is down how would anyone would know that that is down? So they will have to have uh, a system to to monitor all of these uh, microservices which are running on cloud. Same is the case with Amazon. Amazon has even more microservices running to support their Amazon.com and even their backend infrastructure as well. So this is where the orchestration, the container orchestration comes in and they rescue you with many different features to handle these microservices. So first of all, they give you the configuration and scheduling of containers, which means that just in case, if you want your application to have to handle more load at nights, for example, because uh, your application is something like, let's say, Facebook or Twitter or um, something of that sort, a social media kind of application. And you know that people, when they go home after the work and sit in their washrooms, they start using it. So this is where you want to scale up your application. That means you want to increase the number of microservices deploying a deployment on your cloud. So you can configure that. You can schedule it using this. You can deploy maybe 100,000 more microservices at night and kill them in the morning as well. And all of this will be seamless. Nothing will be uh, touched in a, in a way that it will get broken. And even if some microservice gets down because it's not healthy or uh, there was an error or something of that sort, the orchestration engines will restart it automatically. So this this can be done with the provisioning of deployments. And then at times that you would think that you want to automate the A and B testing. That means you want to deploy a new feature to 10% of your audience, and you want to keep the old features for all the rest, uh, uh, all of the rest of the people or the users. What you can do is you can automate this by canary depo deployments. Uh, I'll be taking different acronyms, but you don't get into that. The idea is that you can deploy uh, a and B, or maybe C, D, E, as many different types of deployments for different percentages or regions or even uh, kind of people that, okay, this, this guy is coming from, let's say, India, show him this particular interface or land him to, a dis, uh, to this microservice. So this is how you can control the A and B testing, and all of this can be automated as well. You can scale... For high availability, which I have given you an example, um, at nights you can improve the horizontal scaling by doing it automatically or you can schedule it as well. You can do it on demand as well by running a simple command. You can do load balancing. Since you have 200, uh, uh, since I was giving you an example of Netflix, where it was having 200,000 um, microservices instances running out of 750 microservices so that means it has a lot of different instances for example 20 30 or maybe 100 instances of a single image for example we can say that a streaming server is, has more than 
uh, 500 instances running on cloud each one of them handling the same uh, traffic but how would you route the traffic for that reason you need load balancer the load balancer will sit in your cluster and route the traffic coming from different users based on the usage based on uh, different other rules and criteria that you can define it will also do routing for example uh, a traffic coming from uh, from a particular region and you want to route it to the cd and the cloud uh, uh, cloud front or something of that sort and you want to route it from there you can do that and then it is also it also does the service discovery because the within the cluster nothing can get in until unless you don't expose it using ingress or something of that sort so for service discovery also there are certain services that runs in your cluster then comes the monitoring and analytics which is very important part in in a kubernetes cluster or an orchestration cluster because you would never know how much load is coming on a particular time and define that okay uh, scale it until unless you don't get the analytics of it then security and control obviously it's important and then you can secure your cluster by implementing different security rules and secrets and all that so <clears throat> yeah yeah okay okay sorry to interrupt i'm just going to come in for one question uh, varun d from our uh, from our group, uh, from our live chat has asked uh, and i think you did cover that also but you have experience with kubernetes but how does it compare against docker so that is his question and maybe that might be already okay. covered in what you're going to go on with but uh, i just wanted yeah. to post that to you Okay so basically when i started in my agenda i just mentioned that we will be looking at containerization so containerization is all about dockerization or or making the application uh, images a runnable application images whereas kubernetes is a container orchestration engine so it helps you orchestrate those containers that you build with docker so they go hand in hand it's not that docker is separate or kubernetes is separate they go hand in hand if docker is there kubernetes basically will orchestrate it this is what i explained it here that we were building this docker and then once we build a lot of dockers and we run them on cloud we get into complexity and kubernetes comes in to handle that complexity so yeah i mean i think uh, that's a great point because i know many people including myself have that confusion yeah. they say docker versus kubernetes but you're right it mm-hmm. is completely separate oh. and you have to use hand in hand and uh, of course like yeah. i mean whatever people feel comfortable starting with is what they would go with but uh, you yeah. need to be aware of all those great i'm just yeah. going to i hope that answers varun's question i'm just going to let it uh, get back to your explanation thanks again okay over thank you. you yeah so basically docker also has uh, an orchestration engine which is called as docker swarm we can use that as well but that also does not mean that kubernetes is different or kubernetes uh, each of these uh, orchestration engines like uh, apache mesos conductor is is another uh, orchestration engine by netflix and they are also using and um, I, i forgot its name uh for the infrastructure as well but anyways all of these orchestration engines basically orchestrate these containers in the cloud when they are running so they have nothing to do with the repositories or images they only handle the running images so to deploy uh, your containers into the cloud or on these kubernetes clusters all you need is continuous integration and deployment you can do it manually as well but continuous integration and continuous delivery or deployments are important very important part when you are developing a software application because uh for example netflix deploys a new feature or anything every 10 seconds on their cloud so just imagine 
they have hundreds of thousands of microservices running on cloud. And if they want to uh, run a particular or deploy a particular microservice, what would they have to do? They have to, first of all, kill all those previous running, previously running microservices, then deploy their new feature. And uh, each of these deployments will take time and manually they will have to see that everything is integrated properly. They will have to uh, test it well and then uh, everything goes live. But manually, I cannot even explain that how would they do manually I, because it's, it's hard to imagine it. So continuous integration and continuous delivery basically brings in the concept that the software developers or uh, or the developers of the application are are different from the operations if they are different from the operations or the network operations then what happens is the the concern is different when they develop they don't know what is the infrastructure when they deploy a commit they don't know what is the infrastructure whether it's a, it's a docker swarm or kubernetes or is is it running on aws gke or even on azure they don't know. They just commit on their builds. All that uh, deployment will be handled by the uh, continuous integration and delivery scripts or platform, and it will be well tested for security, for for user acceptance, and everything else. And then it will be monitored by the DevOps, and uh, um, a response will be given back to the developers that okay, your your microservice X has uh, this performance issue, for example. So improve your code or do this or do that. So continuous delivery is very important. Okay, so for implementing continuous integration and continuous delivery, there are many different tools like Jenkins and like GitLab or even now GitHub has started the GitHub Actions and many other uh, platforms like C, uh, Circle CI and uh, all of these what they do is they provide you with the the infrastructure to to handle those uh, this particular continuous integration and delivery pipelines but what gitlab gives you is apart from the uh, continuous integration and continuous delivery it gives you the option to manage your code to plan your builds to plan your uh, project or uh, issues and then create your code on cloud as well then verify it by using different tools, then package it into a, a GitLab a provided Docker repositories. Because uh, as I said, that there are many different uh, Docker registries uh, provided by Google, Docker Hub, and even GitLab. So GitLab provides you a personalized or a secure Docker registry on cloud as well. So this is where you can package it. You can secure that as well, just because it's it's your personalized and it you only have the access to it. And then you can manage your releases as well on GitLab. And there there are ample number of different features that you can utilize on on GitLab. So I'll be going through some of these features while giving you the demo. So I will start with the demo part because there's too much talking already. Let me see what is the time right now. Okay, we have a lot of time. Okay, so I will start with the demo part because uh, we have very less time. So this is where uh, my GitHub repository or GitLab repository and the running application will be on this bit.ly. So I'll keep it here for some time so that you guys can note it. And let me just jump into the code. Okay. So I have prepared this application. It's a it's a very basic sample application which has a server and a, a client side. So this is where my server lives, and this is where my client is. It's a simple Angular client uh, written in Angular JS, and it's a simple Node server. And it does nothing. It has some basic feature of sockets and everything else. But we will not deep dive into the code itself because I I'll not be discussing about the code here. Okay, so what I want is I want to containerize this application and deploy it on cloud uh, and uh, by using GitLab. So all I need is a GitLab account, first of all. 
So you can go there and you can open an account. It's free and you can use it. And you can have my repository. It's public. This is the URL. You can have this repository. I don't know how to make it large, but I have it's the same, same repository here. You can clone it on GitLab. Once you clone it, what will happen is that it will start building. Why? Because I will just use my GitLab instance. Okay. And let me create a new project. So this is what you will be doing. Okay. Demo time. Okay. So when you create a project, it will give you some commands to basically uh, create your repository from your local machine. So what I'm going to do is, on my local machine, the same project that I have, I will deploy on this particular repository. And then from here onwards, I will set up my CI CD. OK. Let me just increase the font size here as well. I hope it's fine. OK, so to do that, I will go here and I will open up. OK, so I want to change my remote, first of all. This is wrong. First of all, I will see what is my remote for this repository. So git remote slash v. So currently, I have these remotes. So first of all, I want to get remote rename uh, origin. So I'm changing my origin, previous project name, and changing into old underscore origin two. OK. OK. So this is it. I have done it. Now I'm connecting my project to my new node, new remote. So if you can see, I have this new remote. That means my, my this project is connected right now. So all I want is push my changes. So to push my changes, all of these instructions are already written over here. But I can just, I think I have made all the comments. I just need to get push origin master. Once I do that, it will be pushed on my this particular project repository. OK, to run this uh, this particular project onto the cluster, all I need is a cluster first. So let's go to the operations part of this particular project that I have selected and go into the Kubernetes page. So I will have to create a Kubernetes cluster for this project using Google Cloud provided or Google Managed Kubernetes engine. I will use my company's email address. OK, the account that you will be using has to have a, a billing enabled on Google Cloud. OK, if it, it doesn't have, then, uh, then it will be refused in the next step. So I will show you how it will be shown. So let's see, assembly. Demo cluster. OK, this is where your projects uh, are, which are coming from the Google Cloud or Google Kubernetes engine. So I will be opening my Google Cloud platform, GCP, just to show you what projects I have and what exactly I can do with this. OK, not this. I need this. Okay. So this is where I can select my projects. There, there are different projects that I have on my uh, cloud. And I can, OK. So here it is. So billing is enabled. You can see over here. The billing is enabled. If the billing is not enabled, you will not be able to run any cluster on this project. 
Okay, let's go to the Kubernetes engine part in the left hand side and see we have any clusters running already. Okay, so we have this GitLab video cluster already running, but we will not be using this cluster, we will be using another cluster. So let's get back to the cluster part. So we will select this particular project, which has the billing enabled already. Once we do that, it will ask us about the zone and number of nodes that we want to use, uh, that we want to run in this cluster. So uh, Kubernetes is made up of nodes and master. So master basically is provided by the Google GKE already, the Google Kubernetes engine already, and it's free of cost. All you need to pay is pay for the nodes that you want to run. So nodes are the instances, or or you would say the the running machines on Google Cloud. So if you see this particular cluster, I have a cluster size of two. So there are two nodes running and a total of four CPUs I'm getting from this cluster. So that means each of these nodes are running two CPUs and a total of 15 GB of memory. That means 7.5 GB each is providing me. So let's get into it. Uh, I will be using only, let's say two. And it, we have to check this. If you don't check this, then you will have to create namespaces and service accounts to connect. And that's a very advanced uh, thing. I can talk about it later. And this option also enables Anthos, which is a new infrastructure or a new uh, cloud platform that is provided by Google to run uh, containers. But maybe some other day we can talk about Anthos as well. So if we create the cluster, it will take some time and quite a lot of time, probably four or five minutes to run that uh, cluster. So when we refresh it here, you will see that, I hope you will see that there is another cluster creating on the cloud. Yeah, so you can see that this, this cluster is getting up in some time. So once that is done, I will be showing you what exactly will happen, but it will take some time. Um, uh, I don't think that, that we will be having enough time. So what we can do is, uh, whenever you will open a project on, on GitHub, I will just show you here, that particular project to set up CI CD, you would need a GitLab CI.yaml file. This is where you will tell GitLab to run cloud your cloud builds, or deploy on the Kubernetes cluster. So this is the core of the file that you would be needing. There will be a Docker files, similar Docker file that I have shown you. For any project, you would need that Docker file uh, to, to containerize, to make it microservices. So the, uh, I, I will go through the Docker file first. So what this Docker file is doing is basically it's packaging my uh, application using Node uh, image from the Docker Hub. And it is installing all the network um, uh, NPM dependencies, then it's copying the code, and then it is running the build. Once the build is done, then it will copy that build into a runner, which is another uh, node server. And then we are running that using the node command once again. So this is all that this particular uh, application is doing. And that's all we need to do to containerize my application. Now to run that on cloud, we need this GitLab CI YAML. Now this particular CI YAML, I will tell you, you don't get uh, overwhelmed by this, all of this information. I will tell you each one of these uh, information that where I have copied it from or how it is running my code. So basically GitLab provides an auto CI option or auto deploy option when you set up a new project. That auto deploy option basically gives you the um, gives you the ability to create a new uh, new file like this. So all you need to do is create a new file in your repository and you will be able to select a GitLab CI. YAML from here and then apply a template. 
this is where you will choose auto devops so in my other project which is a new project since i have git cloned already so we will not be able to do that because when i have git cloned or uh, push the changes from my local repository i push the gitlab ci as well if i haven't done it yet then i will be able to get this option to create another gitlab ci file once we get this information once we get this uh, ci file we just choose auto devops and it will bring me here with all the scripts and all so we copy this from here take it to our code and see what exactly it can do so i will just paste it here and i will show you from here all it is doing is taking an image of alpine latest that is a linux image and then it is creating some variables so basically gitlab has a has a service called uh, build runner so build runner will basically run using this image using these variables and running these scripts or the running these stages these stages are basically the pipelines in your ci cd so it will basically build test deploy review and it 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 does all the staging canary deployments and everything that you might think of uh, for an enterprise application to do on cloud builds but for my uh, scenario i have just a basic deployment so i have kept the same stages but i have utilized only two stages the build and the deploy so let me show you if you don't do that you have all these stages and there is a template that you are bringing in from the gitlab uh, repository which is here and you just mentioning that you copy this configuration from here so gitlab has provided some pre configured build configurations or test configuration or code quality configurations uh, by default for all the microservices based applications so you don't need to do much however i have written many uh, gitlab cis a custom based gitlab cis as well but for most of the cases you don't need that so let's say i don't need test i don't need code quality and i don't need all of this i just want to build and deploy so i will be using these only yeah i'm just coming on screen arsal a quick question for you i mean like uh, you just mentioned okay. that uh, there's a lot of this stuff that you can just uh, you can keep the code on it's fine uh, okay. i just wanted mm -hmm. to ask you regarding that so so this is really interesting i mean a lot of stuff and this is pretty impressive from gitlab in particular you know i mean they seem mm -hmm. to have put a lot of this facility how mm -hmm. easy is it to build like say maybe uh you know a pipeline like this and then take any app say supposing i create a new node js app and then just take mm -hmm. that and just replace it into the mm -hmm. same settings are these all like saved as settings files and uh, you mentioned you have the yaml and uh, uh different things so is it possible to just suddenly like take any existing node js uh, web server and just like uh you know how long would it take maybe convert yeah you you are right you are right basically you can do uh, if if it is node js server python application or anything of that sort basically all you need is a docker file if you have a docker file and you have containerized it already then gitlab would know that this is a microservice and it will understand that using this docker file it has to build your microservice okay so this is where you are telling your uh gitlab ci cd as well by utilizing this docker file you can create a docker container same like i have created earlier uh, and run it on your own machine as well run it every anywhere so basically what you are doing is you are telling the ci cd that this is my container and just run it just build it or run it so gitlab what it does is it has all the code that you have written for your uh, for your microservice it has all your code already on the repository that you have uploaded I, i have just pushed my code on gitlab so it has all the code it will run the docker and docker will basically run the builds so yeah, i will be the, showing you the builds and everything in the pipeline running okay. once we will uh, have that uh, cluster up and running do you use but the testing but my my point is that yeah. these custom 
pre-built scripts would help you 95% of the time. Five percent of the time, when your application gets very complex or it has a lot of things to do, then you might need to write a lot of other scripts as well, or you might have to customize the scripts. So you can go on this particular URL and you can download the the script and you you can do that. That's an advanced uh, thing to do, but I have done it in in some other project like these. Uh, I will just show you if you have to write it for yourself and what exactly you will be writing. So basically, I have written it the same way. But what I have done is, if you see here, I have written many different stages myself. Hmm. Okay, instead of here, where it is very simple, just include these yeah. script files and that's it. So it's all templated. If you see this, this yeah, this is this is all that I have to do. Nice. What about the testing okay. feature? Do you use? Do you actually get uh, in practice? Do you use any of the advanced testing uh, before uh, before you deploy? Like uh, because obviously, if you're auto deploying, you want to have some checks. But what sort yeah. of tests do you do? GitLab basically provides that. So if you see here, GitLab does the testing as well. Okay. But for testing, also again, you need to put the scripts in your code as well. Because GitLab will see that what test, like I, I have this karma.conf. Uh -huh. So GitLab would know that you it has to run the karma configurations and the configurations are written here. So it will understand that, okay, the, based on these configurations, run the test. So it will run the test. It will not only just run the test, it will also do browser performance testing for you. Nice. It will also do the container scanning for any security issues. So if you see, these are all the security tests that it will perform. It will see for any license management. All of these features will be provided in the GitLab uh, enterprise account, but most of it uh, will be provided to you based on the, the scripts that you provide in your code. So it will automatically run those scripts. It's great and that the they main part this. is yeah. that it will do the code quality testing as well. Nice. So when you are running the Docker file, it, it knows that it's a node application because you are using a from node. Mm -hmm. So it will understand that it's a node based uh, or a JavaScript application. So it will start running the code quality test as well. It will detect the files based on their extensions like d.ts, so TypeScript. If it's JS, it's JavaScript. JSX, it's React mm -hmm. or PY, it's Python or something of Java is like for Java or Spring Boot or something of that sort. So based on the file extensions and different other settings, it will automatically detect and start running the code quality test. Oh, this is great. So it's all of this you can do thing. without changing anything in these most of most of the times, 95% of the times you don't need to change. No, oh, wonderful. Okay. okay. So uh, what I have done is just to simplify my deployment, I have just written only build and deploy. So basically, you can choose between what you want to do. You can do by just using the templates of your choice, or you can uh, include here a variable like don't run review if you don't want to, the review to be, uh, to be running. Mm -hmm. So you can just, uh, because review is a stage, so you can just tell the GitLab not to run X, Y, Z oh. stages by doing that. So if you copy that, information it's written over here so so this is where you want to disable so if you want to disable test you just write test test disable code quality you don't want to run code quality disable well, so all you so need to do is if flags. you want to do it yeah now this is amazing i mean that's like i think i think github has a bit of catching up yeah. to do with gitlab on this because this is i had no idea there were it was so sophisticated anyways yeah. so, i will let you get back to your example Thanks for the answer. Yeah. Okay. No problem. So this is how you can disable the code quality as well. Or you can do whatever you want. So in your variables, you need to do this. Anyways, so let's get back to the simplest example of all time that I have. So I have not changed anything. I just removed the, the extra templates and remove all the comments so that you can see that it's a very small file telling GitLab to run my Docker file. That's it. So let's see what will gonna happen when we do this. 
Okay. By if GitLab will find a GitLab CI file in its repository, it will start running the pipelines. So if you see, based on my code, the pipeline has run and it has passed some stages as well. It has passed the build stage. So there, there are no other stages. Uh, this would be possible because the the cluster was not connected. That's why it just ran the build stage. Okay. Now, since our cluster is connected, let us see. Okay. So our assembly demo cluster has been connected to our project. Okay. So we need to do some further installations of different applications on our cluster to basically do the deployments. So what we can do is when you go into the cluster, it will give you the details and everything. It will ask you for a base domain. You can have your domain of your application, for example, it's on click.com. So you can have this over here and then save it. And after that, I need some applications available on GitLab cluster or my Google Kubernetes cluster so that I can start uh, deploying my application. So Helm Tyler is basically a package manager for Kubernetes. So we want to install this first because then it will help us install all the rest of the applications that we need. Okay, so once Helm Tyler is installed on our cluster, we can just install Ingress, Cert Manager, Prometheus, and GitLab Runner. So I'll be telling you about each one of them. Ingress is something that will help the uh, because the cluster is very secured on Google Kubernetes. We cannot access the cluster. It does not provide any IP address or something of that sort to access the applications which are running inside until and unless we have a service or a service discovery built inside our cluster. So this is where we need Ingress. So we are installing this Ingress. This Ingress will provide us with an IP address to access the cluster, which is inside. So from outer world to get inside the cluster, we need an Ingress. And you can modify the application firewall. It's the latest feature that GitLab has introduced over here because previously it was not there. For one second. Uh, yeah. Sorry, just one more question, which we got from uh, Josefa Salim. He's asking, yeah. does two nodes mean one worker and one master node? No, master has been provided by uh, Google Kubernetes already. Okay. That's free of cost. You are just adding the nodes, the He's worker nodes. The nodes. That's it. Okay. Okay, Josefa, I hope that answers your question. I'll put it. Back. Yeah, most, most of the cloud... Kubernetes providers provide the master for free. So this is where we got the IP address. So we can copy this IP address because this is where we will be connecting our uh, cluster from inside. Okay, I'm just gonna okay. leave so, it with you. I hope I hope that answered Josefa's question. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay, now let's get back to base domain. So if you see, once we have installed the ingress on our cluster we have been provided by a uh, a domain which is our base domain we can utilize this base domain as well if we don't have a wildcard domain on fixonclick.com that's an explanation for some other training that what's a wildcard domain but my point is if you don't have a fixonclick.com and you just want to test your application all you need to do is copy this domain which is provided by nip.io and then save it this will create a base domain for your cluster now once the base domain is created we will look into the further installations we have installed the cert manager as well so cert manager will automatically install the ssl certificates i have seen many companies struggling with their ssl certificates and managing their ssl certificates um, last night itself, uh, there was a problem with one of my friends who was working for a company where he was having the issue of installing the cert, man uh, cert certificates, SSL certificates for a particular website. And he, the client has provided him for the .com, whereas he required for an ORG or vice versa. 
So there, there are a lot of issues. It, you just think of microservices and the websites or the the domains that are running, and you want to basically manage all those cert certificates. It's 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 completely complex. But this particular cert manager will help you create the certificates on the fly. You don't need to do anything. Just provide your email address so that it keeps you posted with all the certificates when they are getting renewed and all that. And that's it. And you don't need to install it manually on your Kubernetes cluster. All you need to do is press the install button. It will be installed. And the domain that you have provided here, it will, whenever you will do a deployment, it will ask for a new SSL certificate or whenever there is a new domain created for this particular domain, because there will be some dynamic domains like review or like staging. So this these domains will be created by the cluster uh, because of our CI/CD to test, to uh, do the quality assurance, and many other things. So all of these, uh, for different environments, it will create different domains. So for each of these domains, this cert manager will apply for a SSL certificate auto automatically and install it on the cluster. Then comes the Prometheus. So Prometheus is a, is a monitoring engine. It will also be installed on our uh, Kubernetes cluster to uh, basically uh, monitor the applications that are running on the cluster itself and the health of the cluster itself as well. Then the GitLab runner. So this is what I was talking about when I was talking about uh, the, the runner for uh, running the CI/CD pipeline. So the GitLab runner runs your CI/CD jobs. So this is your uh, processing. Uh, microservice. So it will take your CI CD file, reads it, and then find the code on your repository and build it or do whatever you inform it to do in your CI CD file. So it is required if you want to run your own runner, which is highly recommended. So how you can configure it that which runner runs my code or my CI CD pipeline, you go to the setting, go to the CI CD part, and look for runners. So GitLab provides some shared runners already. You can disable them and you can use your own runners or you can utilize the uh, shared runners. But GitLab provides certain number of hours, like here, two, 2,000 CI minutes per month are free for you. So if you are running your builds, a lot of builds, 2,000 minutes are free if you are using the shared runners. But after that, you need to pay. So they, GitLab has different plans. But what you can do is you can disable them altogether. And you can just use your runners, which are installed in your Kubernetes uh, clusters. So you can see I have two clusters. Each one of them has two, um, two runners. I can enable the other cluster-based uh, runner as well here, just in case if I want to run parallel builds or parallel uh, processing on my GitLab runner, I can use utilize this as well. However, uh, a runner running on Kubernetes engine is is already uh, basically if if you have parallel loads, since it's Kubernetes and you know uh, while I was telling you here in my presentation that Kubernetes does the auto scaling automatically, scaling automatically. So what it will do is when we will run our parallel load on this single runner it will create multiple instances of this runner on the cloud, on Kubernetes engine as well. So you don't need to worry about that. And I will show you that over here. Okay, so let's see. Our operations are all done. Okay, Let's run a pipeline. Let's see, what do we have? Mm -hmm. Okay, so now since I have uh, created my, okay, there is some setting that we need to do, but I will just finish from here. Now, since I I have created my cluster, I have configured my uh, ingress for the cluster, the GitLab has automatically detected that the cluster is already connected, the runner is already uh, configured. 
so it has uh, given me the production pipeline as well so right now it is running the build uh, stage of my pipeline let's get into that okay so if you see here what it is doing is it's running a gitlab runner on this particular runner so gsf is the the id if we go here and see which one of the runners is this one so we go here we see here gsf so you can see it's using this particular runner and if you have enabled the shared runners and if it is running any of these runners you will understand and sometimes you want a particular runner because you want uh, a runner installed with a docker you want a runner installed with microsoft uh, services dot net or something of that sort like shared windows or windows runner so you can utilize these ones as well so how you can utilize is by mentioning the tag in your ci cd uh, file and you can say that i need shared windows so when you will mention this tag gitlab will automatically select all those uh, one of the runner which is free but having this particular tag so this is all from the runners part now after that preparing in kubernetes executor since we have connected kubernetes it has detected that it's a kubernetes executor by doing that it will auto scale the runner whenever uh, additional load or a parallel parallel processing is required or a parallel build is required then it is preparing the environment then it is getting the source from the git repository remember this runner is running in our cluster which is on gke google kubernetes engine here so within this cluster this particular uh, build is running okay this runner is installed and it is running over there so to access my code the git repository has to be cloned here on this particular cluster you will not be able to see what exactly it is but how it is running because there is no display for it but it will do the git clone of my code once that is done it has detected that there is a master branch which has a particular reference and then it is checking out this particular sha then it is skipping the gitlab's uh, sub modules because there is no sub module in my repository and then it it has started running the build process using the ci script so this is the the running before script which is mentioned in my ci script and then after that once the before script is uh, finished then there are some build processes that it will run so let me show you so it is basically pulling from my previously deployed docker image just to do caching because if i have deployed already it will only build the changes so it will not build the complete project again and again so by pulling this from the previous build what previous build if you see that when i deployed my uh, my code it has built already built all of my code already okay so the first time when it was building it never pulled because there was no no image in the repository i will show you somewhere here see it's a huge build that it has run for us wow anyways so it was trying to pull okay here this is where it has started the building process because there is no response from if you see error response from daemon there was nothing here there was nothing here okay not found manifest unknown so since it it was not able to find so it has started from the stage 1 step 1 without pulling uh, anything from the cache however in my new build it has pulled from the cache once that is done once that is done it will read my my environments if you see here 
this is where first step already exists, already exists, already exists. So these three steps were already cached. So it saved some amount of time. I can implement uh, my Docker file in a better way so that it, it will be more performant as well. But anyways, then it has uh, gone through my Docker file, run the npm install. This is how the npm install finished. Then my Docker file said after doing the npm install, do the code copy, which is here, sixth step. Then I told the Docker file to run my build. So when it was running my build, you can see the this is what happened in my application. It has ran a production build. It has ran on the Angular uh, project first. Then once that is finished, then it has ran a Webpack build for my server as well. So my application is made up of two, a client and the server. So both those builds were running. Once that is finished, it, it started removing the containers, then created another container only with the deployment code. And once everything is finished, it has pushed a Docker image onto this particular repository. So we will go there and see how it is. So when we go into the packages, you can see this container registry. So Docker uh, GitLab provides a free container registry up to 10 GB. You can store it over there. So you can see there was one image, and you can see that this is a particular SHA uh, which was used for building the repository. And this is our latest tag. It has just built two minutes ago. So this is your container registry, which has your particular image, your application image. Now let's get back to the pipeline and see the production stage. So the production stage will utilize that registry and pull that prepared images and deploy it on the cloud. So it's, it would be very small stage. Basically, we have installed the Helm and all that. The production stage will only pull the image uh, from here, demo time production, and run it in the, uh, in, in the cluster. Okay, so this is it. It has also ran a lot of other services on uh, Kubernetes cluster. I will go through them very quickly. But this is how it has prepared all, all the job, and the job is succeed. I have done nothing uh, special in the custom CI CD file. Okay. Instead of that, I removed most of the code from this file. Okay. All I have done is written a Docker file. If you know how to write a nice Docker file, that's enough for you to know how to deploy on GitLab because you can use the auto DevOps and you can use only these uh, predefined builds. Once that is done, let's get back to our console and see. Okay, before I do this, I want to tell you that how to connect to Google Cloud. Okay, so since this is our cluster assembly demo, but we need to connect our console with this particular cluster. All we can do is press this connect button, copy this command, and just paste it over here. By doing this, we will connect to our cluster on the cloud. So you can see that we have connected our cube CTL client get all to our cluster. We will not be able to see anything, anything much, but it's connected, and you can see that there is one service, Kubernetes is run. But remember, when GitLab deploys on a cluster, what it does is it creates a namespace for that cluster. And that namespace we need to find by using kubectl get namespaces. So you can see that this is this particular demo time namespace is created. So we will say that kubectl get all dash and this particular namespace. Now we will get to know that what all is running in our namespace. So these are the different containers that are running. So these are the different pods. Now pods are the, the smallest 
uh, executing, uh, you could say, um, instance in the cloud, in the Kubernetes cluster. And these are different services and these are different deployments. So the good thing about the deployment is that if I want to kill this or somehow this particular part is, is not working good, what I can do is I can tell it to restart the part. So kubectl stop, sorry, container uh, rm delete. I'm confused with Docker and kubect. Delete pod and this production. This namespace. Production six B. Okay. So I'm just removing by force this particular part. Okay. Which is running my application. So when I do that, this dis deployment makes sure that I have a running instance of this particular pod at all times. So it will make sure and it will restart my pod automatically. Okay, so I have uh, done it. Okay, get config. I will just run this command because I cannot write the namespace name. Set config. Dash dash current um, namespace oops Oh, this is not Git. See, live demos can be challenging sometimes. Okay. Okay. See, I did go. Cube. Cube CTL. Okay. Now, if I do Cube CTL, get all. without mentioning the namespace. Okay, so I killed the previous one and it has started running again. Okay, how to show that? kubectl describe pod production dash six. Okay, so the container is running and all. You could see that this container is running. If I describe deployment it will tell me that what happened previously okay you can see here the deployment has scaled up the replicas because uh, uh q ctl get uh, deployments Okay, so this particular deployment we were looking at, uh, it is showing that this deployment was scaled up uh, a while ago. Okay, so that's all that we need to do, KGA. So that's all that is running on our namespace or for this particular project on the Kubernetes. Okay, let's test the URLs. To test the URLs or to see the live, all we need to do is go into the environments. We have only the production environment. Let's get into it. Okay. So 
these are the different builds. If you press on the view deployment, uh, view live deployment, you can see there's something wrong with the SSL, but I hope that this SSL will be done after some time. Uh, no, this is some other deployment that I have opened. Okay. Let's keep it from here. Sorry, use demo time. Ah, okay. So I have a old code. I haven't pulled it. Okay, but that build will take a lot of time. So, anyways, I have prepared the project already that I have uh, ran earlier. So this is that particular project, and these are the pipelines so one of my colleague has done some deployments uh, early in the morning or probably late night so i don't have these changes right now in my code so i can pull them and then redeploy it as well but anyhow when we do that after that i have uh, environments here you go to your environments. If you deploy on a particular uh, branch of Git, uh, GitHub or on, on a particular branch using Git, it will create a new environment under the name of that branch. So that's how the environments are. So you open live and our application is running. You can see that our SSL is also configured. Okay. So what this application is all about is just the basic application. It create, just creates a room. Let's say I create a room name Arsalan. So Arsalan. And if I press OK, it will connect me to that room. So you can connect to this particular room, room slash Arsalan. Uh, the same bit.ly URL that I've given you over here. This particular bit.ly URL is running the same client so if you run that you will be connected in in this room so this is it nickel if we have more questions please let me know wow so that was everything that was great stuff uh mm -hmm. i'm just checking if we have more more questions uh no everyone's just answered in so varun d is saying thank you looking forward to more virtual workshops thank you and thank uh, you very much nikhil and atif shaba says nice work aslan mumtaz kazmi said also great explanation aslan so lots of great thank feedback you. coming in this is uh, it's an eye opener for me also i mean i'm uh, you know of course i i'm also a developer and i've used node.js but mm -hmm. i never thought of doing that but the ease with which you've shown that uh, makes it uh, you yeah know, very you know it's yeah it's different. it's super easy people think that it's 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 um, some very difficult stuff but now the latest toolings like uh, circle ci even mm -hmm. or gitlab actions or github actions and gitlab uh, ci cd they have built some amazing tools to help even the normal software developers uh, to deploy on on even kubernetes clusters or openshift clusters or even on on any aws clusters uh, or man, cloud managed kubernetes clusters wow that's no that's fantastic i mean i was just mentally keeping a note of all the tasks you were doing that you were able to automate mm -hmm. and if you had to do those the long way you know the usual yeah. uh, say back you know maybe even a few years ago if you had to do yeah that, it's it's, it's it's completely complex. I was not showing you, but this is how it can get complex. Uh, the normal functions that you write, it can get very complex. The CI, CD, yeah. and even the, the deployment YAMLs and everything, it, yeah, it, it can get it's so much completely complex. So, that where you are managing yeah. all these different things. so that's how you, you write it custom. That's how you write it custom. You write a lot of code. Uh, for your deployments, you write a lot of code for building and all that, and even on the CI CD part. But you can do it on uh, the easy way as well, which is, I, I think, the recommended way of 
doing it nowadays if your application is not very complex now what's great also is like because it's all so modularized i think you could if uh, potentially in a company in a big organization you could have the developers concentrating on their part of like building all yeah. the modules and the devops yeah. guy could handle all this with a little bit of code and you know of course they need a little yeah. bit of uh, where they access gitlab together and then yeah. something but you could completely separate the functions and you could add on and people could work side by side and it would make you a lot more efficient yeah. so this yeah. is a great tool Um, so you can see here that multiple team members like i was building this application initially hmm. and later on one of my team member has deployed or basically push the code the push the code changes so if you see when i was showing you this one this particular application is all till here till here where i have done this because uh, after that uh, my my colleague has done some deployments and i haven't pulled it hmm. uh, and before pulling i have pushed it to gitlab and try to deploy it so this is what happened That's so but once i have done it analytics also i'm sure yeah mm-hmm. yeah and the analytics part i you can just go to the operations and you go to the metrics mm-hmm. and this is where because of installing the prometheus you will get a lot of uh, complex analytics from your cluster as well as your microservice nice. so you could see that the memory usage the core usage uh, the the memory usage uh, by the pod because if you oh. see the pod was running and later on i killed the pod once i killed it it again started run so the core usage and everything you can you can see uh, from the matrix part this is just only we installed the prometheus and gitlab has integrated prometheus dashboard onto the uh, gitlab itself no oh, fantastic no that's a that's a lot of great stuff um arshan yeah. yeah, uh, i will get the links from you also and i'll share that on our description yeah. uh and yeah. then, you know people can definitely uh, you you uh, also do, share your do you think that you would need this uh this presentation or uh, i i think this the, these links are enough the this is the public repository you can pull from this particular repository and to run the application you can just uh yeah. run it from here the medium article you did because that was also very detailed yeah and yeah you yeah can you, you can put that there. in the description great okay i will share all of that um uh, yeah no i mean that's about it i think like and we were good for time also i was when you Thank said you. all that stuff was going to be done i didn't think it would be possible in about an yeah. hour you know i mean after the explanation so that's yeah. a big if we you know a big tick mark for how effective this medium is uh thank you again yeah. arsalan and appreciate thank it. you i i know like uh, you are uh, your time is like uh, very precious because you you obviously are working on live situations and like i said software thank you. these days is is right at the forefront so there yeah no, nowadays people ask uh, you know how are the vacations going on so most of the people yeah i'm sleeping uh, waking up and eating and then sleeping again and again and again but we are software developers so our answer is that we are software developers developers so. and it people are like uh, <laughs> uh, in general system yeah. people i think are working overtime now more than anything uh, i've seen yeah. most, there are lots of systems there's a lot of load so many people using things yeah yeah uh, you need yeah. a lot of we uh, have been using these mediums already the zoom and the the team we were and all the team meetings and everything and we have been working remotely the software developer has nothing new except the fear of the the <laughs> this this current fear that everybody has exactly except yeah, that software to... engineers are always the same uh, they have all these pressures you know uh, working from home working from remote uh, giving presentations from remote and everything is is no different to for the software yeah. engineers or it uh, professionals it's a, it's i would new, say it's a new way of doing things but for most people yeah. but we are used to it you're right uh, mm. thank you again um, and we'll definitely no like touch base with you again i'm sure there'll be lots more questions uh, and you know people will be keen to see so uh, thank you again for doing this i i remember like uh, uh, you've been a member we met at show and tech of course 
last year. Yeah, and in five, and in, in five. five. So, yeah, um, yeah. Hope to see you again. Hope, hope to see you again. Hope to I hope that. Uh, and uh, once everything opens up, I hopefully we'll maybe get yeah. you back for a live cool. session as well. Thank you cool. again, cool. and have a great day. Thank you. Okay. You too, Nickel. Thank you. Bye. Okay, signing off, everyone, from both of us.